Turn in your Bibles, please, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. For our responsive reading, we read the first 12 verses of the second chapter. Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica. And what we're going to do today is look at verses 13 to 16 because of what he goes on to say. As we're thinking about, remember the overarching theme here, five truths that shape the Christian life. Why are we, why are we looking at this? We were studying in 1 Corinthians, going verse by verse, line by line, precept by precept. The answer is for the month of October, <clears throat> spilling over into the first Sunday of November, we will be looking uh, and celebrating together from the Word with a historical theological backdrop the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century. And so these five truths that shape the Christian life are otherwise known as the five solas. What we're doing, just to help you understand, and I hope you'll plug into all of it, is on Sunday morning, we are preaching from the Scriptures on the theme of one of the solas, and then on Sunday evening, we're watching a brief video from some, some really fine theological minds that anticipates the next Sunday's message. So last Sunday night, if you were here, you know that we watched a video on the discussion of sola scriptura, scripture alone. So this morning, we're preaching on sola scriptura. And then tonight, we will watch a video regarding sola gratia, grace alone. And then next Sunday morning, Lord willing, we will open the Scriptures and we will search, search them and preach on sola gratia and so on and so forth. And we will do this consecutively, Lord willing, until the first Sunday in November of when we will wrap up the five solas with soli deo gloria, to the glory of God alone. So today looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, as we're thinking about Scripture alone, or sola scriptura. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 to 16. Stand with me if you would. I hope you have this in your Bibles. I hope you have a Bible. If you don't, we've got the text on the screen for you, but I really want you to have your own Scripture. Uh, you'll see why increasingly, I think, when we look at sola scriptura this morning. Paul goes on to say, after the first 12 verses that we read together, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, he's talking about the preaching that Paul did in Thessalonica, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. For you brothers became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. Interesting. They had never been to Judea, these Thessalonican believers. For you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out and displeased God and opposed all mankind by hindering us from speaking to the Gentiles that they might be saved. So as always to fill up the measure of their sins, but wrath, has come upon them at last. We've read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Sola Scriptura. Thank you. Please be seated. I told you before that these five solas, these are Latin terms. Sola Scriptura is a Christian theological doctrine which holds that the Christian Scriptures are the sole or only infallible rule of faith and practice. R.C. Sproul was writing about this several years ago. and He asked this question. He says, does the Bible teach sola scriptura? Here's his answer. No and yes. The Bible does not have a specific text that suggests that the Bible alone is our final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Those who delight to point this out, and there will be people, if you, if you have a conversation at work that where does the Bible say that about itself? Now, they don't believe the Bible to begin with, so I don't know why they would be concerned whether or not the Bible says it, but that's, that's another discussion. 
those who delight to point this out. However, typically, the Roman Catholics, Eastern Orthodox, and I would lump in there most of the American culture now, typically miss the point. First, their energies more often than not are aimed at the Anabaptist era. Remember last week as we were introducing this, we told you that we come from a strand, my, my mother's upbringing notwithstanding, we come from a strand where we uh, have influence from the, from the Protestant Reformation, uh, from the Puritans, and from the Anabaptists. But there was an Anabaptist error called solo scriptura. Subtle difference. One letter, S-O-L-O, -O, solo scriptura, S-O-L-A, sola scriptura. Solo scriptura was the idea that all I need is me and my Bible, nothing else. That I can sit alone with my Bible. People are doing that today. I, I bump into them all the time talking to them. Oh, no, I don't, I don't bother to attend worship. I have my Bible. Okay. Solo scripture. It's a pernicious error. Because, see, it takes out the wisdom of church history. You and I are not the per first people to think about sola scriptura. It's been going on for centuries. We're not original thinkers. In fact, if you want to, if you want to see how dangerous that idea is, hand a typical person today a first grade primer from years and years ago and I promise you they won't understand most of it. So we haven't advanced in our capacity to understand. We need input from those who've gone before. We, as the video said, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And so, sola scriptura, yes. Solo scriptura, no. It's not what it means. Sproul says, solo scriptura is a reprehensible and ignorant and ahistorical belief. You bump into people that believe that, even in town today, gathered in churches. Solo scriptura, however, like the scriptures themselves, recognizes that God has gifted the church with teachers and pastors. It recognizes that the church has progressed and reached consensus on critical issues in and through the ancient ecumenical creeds. Now, two ditches to avoid. One is the notion of solo scripture that I, on my own, unaided, can comprehend the breadth and height and depth of the Word of God, and I don't need anybody to shed any light on it for me. Stay out of that ditch. The other ditch is to make uh, church tradition church creeds authoritative on a par with Scripture. That was the day that Luther lived in, and we'll see this a little more fully in a moment. So we recognize we stand on the shoulders of giants. We also recognize those giants have feet of clay. The Bible alone is our final authority because it alone is the Word of God. It's been attested, authenticated by God Himself. Miracles serve as the divine stamp of approval by God, the proof that it is a message from God. Remember Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 2? This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Attested by miracle. Jesus himself used something like this when he was teaching. It recorded in Matthew 9, 1 to 8. Remember, it says they, they got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic. We've studied that passage in Mark and other places. Lying on a bed, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Remember we talked about it. That wasn't what the friends were looking for who were up on the roof. Take heart, my son, your, son, your sins are forgiven. Behold, some of the, of the scribes said to themselves, 
not out loud. This man's blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your thoughts, your hearts? Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say, rise and walk? Well, obviously you can't test in a concrete way your sins are forgiven. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed and go home. And he rose and went home. And when the crowd saw it, they were fearful, they were afraid. And they glorified God who had given such authority to men. The authority connected to the miracle. So, there are those you'll find in, in Roman Catholicism today, in Eastern Orthodoxy today, in much of Charismania today, who claim some sort of authority to speak. Uh, actually, when they speak, that they're speaking revelation. The test needs to be, can these people raise the dead? Uh, that was the test in the early church. Can they raise the dead? Not say they have. Not say they've seen it. Can they, in the presence of competent witnesses, raise the dead? If they can't, then they're just blowing smoke about their own revelatory authority. The Bible is God's Word. It's perspicuous, a fancy word that means it's clear. Well, there's some passages that are not, but you have to, I think it was, uh, was it Mark Twain that said, I'm not bothered by the passages of Scripture that I don't understand. I'm bothered by the ones that I do understand. It's perspicuous, it's clear. It says what it means, it means what it says. It's attested by the miraculous power of God. In all these things alone, By itself, it equips for every good work. When you hear someone say, more is required to understand, or more is required to obey, walk away from such a person. Sola, scriptura. This is why Luther, we mentioned this last week, standing at the Diet of Worms in 1521, said what he said. And I want to talk just real briefly. I just referenced that last week. I want you to look with me into the Diet of Worms this morning. There were a lot of things happening in Europe uh, in the first two decades of the 16th century. Think about this. There had been the rediscovery and study of Christian and Roman culture known as the Renaissance and humanism. And it called into question much of what was then contemporary Christian culture. Discovery of an exploration of a, of a new non-European world around our house these last few days with Monday coming, Columbus Day. I don't care what anybody tells you the, how upset they get, get their, their nighty in a knot. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue in search of something new. He didn't find what he thought he was going to find, but what he did find has been very helpful and beneficial to us. So there's this discovery, this expansion of non-European world, expanded trade, led to what was later called capitalism. This is all happening around Luther. The Holy Roman Empire, uh, a symbiotic relationship between spiritual and temporal rulers, pope and emperor, was being threatened by a massive invasion of Muslims led by Turkish sultans. They've been a, they've been a pest, pestiferous mess for a long time. Moreover, the unity of Christendom was being imperiled by the fast-growing reform movement started by Martin Luther. In this turbulent era, this assembly, they called them diets, it was not, it had nothing to do with food, the Diet of Worms, in Worms, Germany. This assembly held at Worms in 1521 was an attempt to preserve the unity of the church in the face of all these things. Politics and religion had become strange bedfellows in Germany. The Golden Bull of 1356 had provided for the election of an emperor by a majority vote of four secular and three ecclesiastical princes. Two years before this meeting in Worms, the elector Frederick the Wise 
had cast a deciding vote in favor of Charles I of Spain to become Charles V, Holy Roman Emperor. I think it, it was a very young fellow. Luther was Frederick's subject. In other words, he, he lived under him. When the papacy moved to silence Luther, Frederick insisted that his professor, a growing attraction at the University of Wittenberg, newly founded by Frederick, Frederick had founded the university, that he be heard, Frederick said, on German soil and treated fairly. They had an idea that if, if Luther was taken to Rome, uh, he would probably end up under one of the steps of, uh, of one of the things that was being built there uh, in concrete. As a result, Luther had a hearing before a cardinal in Augsburg in 1518, and he could debate the issue of papal authority at a well-publicized event at the University of Leipzig in 1519. He was also free in 1520 to publish his ideas on church reform through best-selling treatises such as uh, the not-so-flattering Babylonian captivity of the church, it was a critique of the hierarchical system and of the sacraments, and the freedom of the Christian, uh, his expose on Christian liberty, liberated from bondage to a church claiming to have an inerrant structure. In 1520, Rome threatened to excommunicate Luther unless he recanted, but the Wittenberg professor refused to do so. The letter threatening excommunication was burned in a festive bonfire staged by faculty and students in December. Luther's actual excommunication by papal bull in January 1521 only fueled the opposition to Rome. Under pressure from Elector Frederick and other princes, Emperor Charles V agreed to hear Luther at a German diet, a German assembly, scheduled to meet in Worms in the spring of 1521. Rome hoped, this was their, their desires, that the diet would reject Luther's cause, thus easing the task of a general council of bishops chaired by the Pope who would be dealing with the religious issues raised. But virtually, by this time, virtually all of Germany is supporting Luther. As the official papal representative to the Diet, Jerome Meander put in his secret message to Rome, this is him writing back, nine-tenths of the people in Germany are shouting, Luther! And the other tenth are crying, death to the Roman court. So Luther had the people in his hands following him. Luther appeared before the Diet on April 17th at 4 p.m. after a triumphant uh, journey from Wittenberg where he was hailed along the way as a hero by the people. Silence descended upon, this is a description of the meeting. Silence descended on the room where the Diet was meeting. A representative of the emperor asked Luther, this is Johann Eck, to respond to two questions. Did he acknowledge the authorship of books that had been brought to the Diet and bore his name? They're spread out on a table. Would he stand by them or retract anything in them? And that's when his answer was, well, they're books of different matters. I mean, it's... Luther asked for time to reflect before answering, and he was granted 24 hours. On April the 18th at 6 p.m., when they come back together, he gave his now famous answer. Here it is. It's on the screen. Unless I'm convinced by the testimony of Scripture or by clear reason, for I trust neither Pope nor counsel alone, since it is well known that they have often erred and contradicted themselves, I am bound by the Scriptures I have cited. For my conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and will not recant anything since to act against one's conscience is neither safe nor right. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. God help me. In the face of that, the next day, the 19-year-old emperor, Charles V, called Luther a notorious heretic who would have to be silenced. A rump session of the Diet approved a condemnation edict on May 26th. The edict called Luther a criminal who had committed high treason. It demanded the capture of Luther and his disciples. 
It condemned the demon in the appearance of a man, that's their description of Luther, as the leader of a notorious heresy that must be exterminated. In short, Luther was condemned to death, albeit in absentia, he was not there, for he had been persuaded to leave Worms earlier. Elector Frederick arranged a kidnapping of the homeward bound Luther and hid him at Wartburg, his castle in Thuringia. Luther stayed there until March 1522, when unrest drove him to return to Wittenberg. The result of this council, one, this one writer observed this, I thought, it revealed two radically differing worldviews. Charles V, armed with the powerful weapons of ecclesiastical ban and imperial de edict, embodied institutional authority. Luther stood for the Word of God, as revealed in Holy Scripture, which promised freedom from all human bondage, including death. Luther summarized his view in two seemingly contradictory propositions. Listen to it. Quote, a Christian is perfectly free Lord of all, subject to none. He goes on, a Christian is, perfect, is a perfectly dutiful servant of all, subject to all. And there's, there's the beautiful balance. Freedom in Christ means that no one can be the Lord of our conscience except Jesus himself. Freedom in Christ means that we are free not to live as we want to, but free to live as Christ would call us to serve one another. For Luther, faith in Christ frees humans from their human righteousness by binding them to the righteousness of Christ. Believers are subject to no human powers, although they are to serve neighbors in need as if they were slaves. Luther's descent at Worms was a testimony to Christian freedom. Subsequent descent has often been grounded in notions of human rights like freedom of speech. Luther might or might not have agreed with these notions. It is clear, however, that he clung to the ancient biblical mandate to honor no power other than the power of the Word of God, no power that would contradict the Word of God. So that's a little background to what brings us to consider sola scriptura. You can see where that term would come out of the Reformation. With Luther so committed to the full authority, the preeminent authority of the scriptures. So our text in verse 13 says, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. That, that's really what every one of us, where we all stand. You can't deny that there is a body of material called the Bible or the Word of God. It's there. Do you accept it as the Word of God? In fact, if you've been around here when, we've, when we have ordained deacons, that's one of the questions. Do you accept this as the Word of God? The only inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient standard for life and godliness. You either accept it as that or you reject it and say, well, it's just the words of men. We talked last Sunday night. In that case, what is your authority? We all have authorities. Whether you've identified yours or not, you operate daily by an authority. You make the decisions you make in life based upon a spoken or unspoken authority. For some, it's their, their felt truth. It's a big thing today. Well, that's, that's your truth. My truth is different. Well, what is true? How do we know truth? There's a fancy study that you, that you have in, uh, in ethics and in philosophy called epistemology. It's the source of knowledge. How do you know what you know? It's amazing what we accept as true. Two plus two is what? It's not what you feel that it is. Two plus two is what? Four. How do you know that? Have you ever proven it? The shortest distance between two points is a what? Straight line. How do you know that? Do you know the proof of that, what it is? The proof of that is to draw the infinite possibilities other than a straight line. Now, my point is we accept a lot of things as true with a whole lot less basis for authority. So we have to answer the question. You need to work 
with your children because they may grow up. Some of mine have grow up to think, I know, I know, Daddy, I know the Bible says that. But when that little conjunction, that adversative conjunction comes in, but what it means is I appeal to something different. My feelings, my peers, the newspaper. Paul says to the Thessalonians, we thank God. We continually that when you received the Word of God, when you, when you responded to the preaching that you heard from us, you accepted it not as the Word of men, but as what it really is, the Word of God. These folks in Thessalonica did not have a course in, in biblical languages or world thought. They heard the word preached. The Spirit convinced them of its truth. And they believed. And so we make this whole idea of the word of God, embracing it too complicated. How do I know? Well, how do you know it's not? I mean, you're not the first person to think about this. There have been, there have been a couple of thousand years for folks to give some serious thought to this. See, there is a certain faith element, folks. If I've got to prove to you jot and tittle about the authenticity and the authority, the inerrancy, the infallibility, and the sufficiency of the Scriptures, then you basically have said, I'm, I'm in a position where I'm, I believe myself wiser than God. Paul was able to thank the Thessalonians, thank God for the Thessalonians, and their attitude toward it. You embraced it as the Word of God. Well, you know, Jesus embraced the scriptures and it would take a whole nother sermon just to look at Jesus attitude toward the scriptures but I would just remind you he said that not one jot or tittle of the law will fall away that heaven and earth may pass away but what not jot he's talking about little little mark, markings of the words themselves but not a jot or a tittle will, will pass away Jesus, and he quotes, we could cite to you, he, he, he calls uh, several of the writers, he, he speaks of Abel as a real individual, Noah in the flood, Abraham, Sodom and Gomorrah as a real place, Lot and his wife, Isaac and Jacob, the manna, the serpent. I mean, just you go read Jesus' teachings and he just references things in the Old Testament as true. If they were not and he doesn't know it, we have a serious problem with this one we're trusting in for our eternal destiny. Jesus believed the Scriptures. He believed the authors of the Scriptures. We're looking at this on Sunday nights when we get back to seeing Jesus in all the Scriptures. He believed the authors of the books of the Old Testament were who they're identified to be. He never challenged the Scriptures. He said he was the subject. We're looking at that on Sunday. He was... They speak of him. But just real quickly, I want us to see what we can see about what was Peter, and by implication when Peter speaks, he's speaking for the apostolic band. What was the disciples' attitude towards Scripture? What was, what was Paul's? Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter 1, 16 to 21. Remember this when someone tells you that they got a revelation from God privately. But we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power of and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when we, he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. He's talking about perhaps the baptism, but definitely the Mount of Transfiguration experience. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain, the Mount of Transfiguration. When we have the prophetic voice, the prophetic word more fully confirmed. Watch this. That was amazing, hearing God's voice. But it's been more fully confirmed. You don't need to hear God's voice. God has spoken to prophets and apostles, and they've been written down. Listen. To which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Remember the psalmist saying, Your word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I'll hide its words in my heart that I might not sin against you. 
until the day dawns, Peter said, and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own or private interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried, they were borne along carefully by the Holy Spirit. Peter asserts that what he saw was in amazing but what God has written down in the Old Testament and in his own writings, in the writings of Paul, you're going to see this in a minute, is surer than hearing the voice of God. 2 Peter 3, 15 and 16, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, divine wisdom, Paul asserts this in 1 Corinthians 2, we looked at this already, as he does in all his letters, when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures. Peter connects half of the New Testament to have the same authority as all of the Old Testament. And Paul says in Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, you're familiar with this, 14 to 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, from his mama and his grandma, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture, the Old Testament, is theonoustos, breathed by God. All of it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. In order that, purpose clause, the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Because you see, Paul says in our text today, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. When you receive the word of God, it's not simply an empirical a mind thing. Well, okay, I, I see. I'm, I'm convinced. It's Scripture. No, when you receive the Word of God, acknowledge that it is the Word of God. It is transformative. So Paul could say in Romans, in view of God's mercy, stop being conformed to the world. Keep on being transformed, metamorphosis, from the inside out. by the renewing of your mind. It's transformative. A lot of people will nod. Oh yeah, I heard a fellow say, look, I believe the Bible. I believe the Bible from generations to revolutions. I said, well, it's Genesis to Revelation, but that's a discussion for another time. The names of the books of the Bible. A lot of people do that. Wooden-headed parroting what they've heard somebody else say. But the receiving of the Word of God, sola scriptura, is transformative. Here's what one writer said. To put it provocatively, the Bible is not enough. The message given through Jesus and his apostles doesn't survive simply by being written down it also needs to be passed on through a living succession of disciples, teachers, preachers, parents. It needs to be entrusted to faithful people who can guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit. So Calvin, in his commentary on 1 Timothy 3, 15 says, the kingdom of God is preserved on earth by the ministry of the church alone. The reason why the church is called the pillar of truth is that she defends and spreads it by her agency. God does not himself come down from heaven to us, nor does he daily send angels to make known his truth, but he employs pastors whom he's appointed for that purpose. This commendation relates to the ministry of the word. For if that be removed, the truth of God will fall to the ground. All we have to do is have a closed Bible that we do not read a closed Bible that we do not share. 
Sola Scriptura. Scripture is the only authority that is preeminent. Anything else we believe, anything else we read needs to line up with this book or be rejected. We find ourselves thinking sometimes I meet people, well, I've always thought, and that's not true because none of us have always thought things about stuff. I've always thought it's kind of a cover-up for, well, this just came to my mind and I thought I would share. So check it with the Scriptures. Check it with the Scriptures. Is this your authority? If it is, then by the Holy Spirit, it's transforming your life. It's influencing how you think, how you act, what you say. And how the church needs to recover sola scriptura. I liked what Norman said earlier reading from Thessalonians. One of the greatest joys a pastor has is to serve a congregation that is at peace with themselves, with one another. The Bible teaches that. That's not, that's not in the heart of man. The heart of man says, I want my way. My way is more important than yours. Serve me. Pamper me. Take care of me. What's in it for me? Scripture says, get on your knee. Take a towel. Serve one another in love. Scripture teaches that. Scripture teaches we cannot be content to sit at home or even sit in church when the world around us is dying without Christ. We've been beggars. You were a beggar. I was a beggar. I didn't have any bread of life. Somebody shared the bread of life with me. The Lord made it come alive in my life and has fed my soul. If you're saved here today, you're a beggar who's been given bread. And all around you are beggars who know nothing of the bread of life. And they're perishing. You see, Sola Scriptura changes things. Changes things. Is it your authority above all else? Are your thoughts and actions, desires measured by this book? Are you shaped by this book? If so, you're an heir of Reformation. If you claim to be saved by grace through faith, you're an heir of the Reformation. We're going to look at Sola Gratia next week. But are you, are you pounding out the implications of sola scriptura? If you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, this word promises you. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That he will turn away no one who comes to him. And he invites sinners to come as sinners.